Hello, welcome everybody. I am here with Mackenzie. We are going to be doing a book chat about Toil and Snare. They will, I'm sure, be spoilers. So make sure you read it and I'm excited to jump in. Yeah, I was actually trying to talk about it with someone and I was like, I can't, you just have to read it. <laughs> Anything I say will ruin it. Read and it first and then we'll talk about it. Should we, can I summarize what it is? Yeah, what I sounds it? perfect. Okay, so it's a story about a girl named Daphne and it takes place in Alaska and it's it's not a retelling of Rebecca, but it mm -mm. has all these little, maybe like all yeah. which I super loved. Do you remember, it was a couple weeks ago and I read the first title and I said, oh, this reminds me of Rebecca. I know. But you didn't say anything and I thought, of course I didn't. I thought, oh no, I just did a faux pas. <laughs> and then I read it and I said, that dirty dog. <laughs> so for people who don't know, Rebecca is a book by Daphne. And I don't know how to say your last name. Do you? Demore. I think it's Morier. Which Maurier. I am obsessed with. I've read every single thing that she's written. And I don't know how to pronounce her last name. But... <laughs> So she was writing, I don't know, early 1900s, maybe. Yeah. <clears throat> and her most famous book is called Rebecca. And the basic story of that is there's a young woman who's never named, which I think is so fun. And she's like a governess or a, what do you call it? Like an assistant, a companion. a companion, that's the word, to this like rich old annoying lady <laughs> who I think is Mrs. Van Hopper. That's what I'm I think trying that's her to name. like. Her name. Because she's annoying, but she's also right. <laughs> and so she falls in love with a widower. They, she moves into his huge estate and then there's all kinds of stuff. So yeah, I would, yeah, I wouldn't call Toys and Snares a retelling, but yeah, an homage, I guess, because so the first lines are similar. The book Rebecca starts like last night I dreamed I was back at Manderley which is the name of the mansion and also in Toils of Stairs the name of the fiance or the ex-girlfriend so there's some allusions there definitely the idea of a poorer girl marrying into a family that's a significantly higher social class and then all the stuff that's going on underneath they're not as picture perfect as they seem it's all similar to how Rebecca reads and then I just stole a lot of the names I would guess maybe at least like 80 percent of the names of the characters I thought it was so fun as someone who loves Rebecca and has read it almost every fall I was mm -hmm. like this is fantastic <laughs> so where did the spark for this idea come from and I'm curious to know, was it the plot first or was Daphne first? I don't really remember how it started. I do. I've always liked the feel of Rebecca. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of my other books, it's one of my women fiction novels. It's Before the Dawn. It's similar in that the main character is never given a name. And so that again, it's that was probably the first time I deliberately paid homage to the book Rebecca. And... I knew I wanted the feel of it. I knew I wanted something more in Alaska just because it's a fun place to write. I don't really remember between there and how it started. When it started, actually, Daphne was going to be the daughter of like a serial killer. And she was going to have mm -hmm. to be coming to terms with her father's crimes. And do you remember... Wait, I bet that I know it. Months ago, I texted you. We had just read one of the Kennedy books where they're stuck in Alaska. And it's the guy. <laughs> and there's this guy, Roger. Mm -hmm. And he's this abductor. Did Roger die in the book? <laughs> because yeah. in my mind, it started out like maybe she could be Roger's daughter. The other thing, going back to that book. So that book is secluded and it's later on in the Kennedy series. But that book also, as a side, the... Mountain Man Roger, the creep and criminal. Years ago, he had abducted a barista from Anchorage, which did happen several years ago when our kids were growing up and we lived in Anchorage. And I've always wanted to explore that story more. So at one point, when I first started, the idea was Daphne was going to be the daughter of the creep who kidnapped the barista and her roommate Becca was going to be the barista's sister. And they were connected because of their mm. grief and I don't really remember exactly like it, it didn't stay that way for very long but that was the idea I went into it with that's so funny because as soon as she was like her dad's past in the cabin I was like there's no way <laughs> she's gonna pull this off in 200 pages there's a lot to dissect that's so funny 
and this was such a different reading experience for me because it was recent and I'm also mm -hmm. like refraining from being like hey so uh -huh. so the writing process was more there was an expectation for a book mm -hmm. and then you wrote it yeah and it was start and stop in my Achilles heel with writing is if I start a novel and then I get interrupted even if it's something kind of small like I get sick for a week or find out we're going to be moving across town like it's almost it feels pretty impossible for me to pick it back up mm -hmm. it's once I start I don't know if you're like this with running. It's once I start, I really can't lose focus or it's just, it's gone. <laughs> yeah. Because there were several points where if I hadn't had like a deadline and an expectation from others, I would have said, okay, here's another half finished project I didn't complete. The worst. Did I tell you what happened when I went to Juno with this book? <laughs> so one of my high schoolers participated in a poetry competition and he and I went to Juno so he could compete at the state level. And that was, I had maybe like the last five or six chapters to write. And it was pretty close to when things were going to be due. So my plan was I was going to travel down to Juno with my son while he was doing, it was a couple days event and they, the kids had different excursions and things planned. So I was just going to sit in the hotel and get really comfy and cozy and just write. So I got to Juno my first night in. I realized I don't have my laptop cord. <laughs> Computer has like a total of maybe two hours. Oh. And so I jump online and like, you know, it's the capital of Alaska, but it's not a very big city and I didn't have a car. And so I'm like, I'm Googling, is there any place to walk to? I'm calling there's some like computer repair shop. I'm trying to call their number. Nobody picks up. So then I find out that there is like an Office Max or Office Depot, one of those stores, but it's 10 miles away. So I'm going to need a ride there. So the very first thing in the morning, I call the woman who coordinates the event. And I don't really know her at all other mm -hmm. than just like she's a woman who coordinates the event and I had her cell number. <laughs> like, Here's what's going on. I'm on this really tight deadline. Is there any way that you know anybody? Like I was close to jumping on like Juno forums on Facebook. <laughs> this is the kind of computer I have. Does anybody have a cord that fits it? But she had to do a pickup at the airport that day. And it turned out the office store was on the way. And so she dropped me off at the office store. Like my heart's pounding. I show my laptop to the very first guy. I trust him like, I need a card for this. And he finds me something and is like, can we test and see that it's the right size? You got to buy it first. Yeah. Then we can <laughs> test it. And if it doesn't, you can return it. And so like, we're checking out, my hands are shaking. <laughs> I buy it and I'm like, okay, let's test it. I put it in. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> Nothing like to get the adrenaline like pumping it out. It really of was. That's a cool little story though. So you talked about how it'd been a while before, since your last book mm -hmm. and this one, was there anything noticeably different about the writing process besides the fact that you were on a deadline? So it's a little different. Creative that process. part was different. And I deliberately tried to make it less connected to my other book. So technically like the whole stuff with the barista, that was just all in my head. That's not like canon to the story. And so this was... As far as I remember, there's no characters from this that are shared with characters in my other books because it was just getting a little too hard to remember who's what age, who's where, who married, who did I kill off, who didn't I not <laughs> <I> bring back. <laughs> so this one's different in that, yeah, there's not any connection to any of my other novels. So it felt like a, yeah, like a fresh start. Cool. Where did the idea for, you talked about the idea for Frank Chilliku, where that came from. But what about Daphne's mom? Oh, okay. My friend Jamie, she and I run the Praying Christian Women podcast together. I never met her mom, but she was diagnosed with early dementia. I think in her 50s it was. And so a lot of that is stuff. Some of it's very specific to Jamie's story. Because I've always told her, like, I'm going to write your mom into a book mm. one of these days. And... So some of it was very specific. A couple of the specifics I remember, Jamie told me about trying to help her mom shower or bathe and her mom thought she was trying to drown her. That feeling of the day you drop your mom off at a home and have to walk away and how hard that is. And then at the very end, there's a conversation 
where the mom gets like a tiny bit lucid and she's like, oh, Daphne, she's the best thing that ever happened to me. That's a story from what happened with Jamie and her mom as well. Oh, and another thing, before I had kids, I worked at an assisted living home on the dementia floor. And I don't think there were any specific stories from there, but yeah, just that, that idea of being scared of losing yourself. Like I said, when the beginning story was going to be like Daphne's the daughter of a serial killer and trying to Mm -hmm. figure that out. Are my genes tainted with my father's like horrible monstrosity? That didn't plan, but she, it turned into the opposite. So now she's like, am I going to be inheriting what my mom had and stuff like that? When I thought that she was going to be the daughter of a silly killer because I was like <laughs> trying to feel it out. Ready for it? <laughs> yeah, I actually had written down, and it still goes for Daphne's mom, like how does the church walk alongside someone who is the child of someone who is mentally deteriorating or mm-hmm. might have a mental illness? Like how yeah, is someone... Who is criminal. Yeah, like how do yeah. we do that? Yeah, because I feel like... Let's just take our church and let's just say like someone moves into the community and she's this nice woman in her thirties and like pretty typical Christian Alaskan single lady and we're friends. And then all of a sudden it comes out, oh yeah, and by the way, my father was this. I think like I've been in the true crime world for quite a while. So I think my reaction would be like, that must be a ton to digest. That must be so hard to accept because I've read a couple memoirs from the children of serial killers. And one of the things that had this book gone that way, I would have explored is that sense of, okay, I love my dad. My dad made me feel safe. My dad was my hero. And when he wasn't at home, my dad was a totally different person. So how do you combine Mm -hmm. those two truths about somebody without breaking your own brain yeah. and your own psyche. Yeah. There's a lot of compassion That's so, on in that. Yeah. So Daphne draws and she prior journals and Daphne ma- Daphne's mom sings and that's mm-hmm. part of the title. Right. So what role would you say art or any form of creativity plays in faith? Because for both of them, it's an expression. It's very much tied into their act of worship And so I think what I was trying to do more specifically with Daphne and her drawing, I didn't think about it. So that might have been more on a subconscious level. But with Daphne and her drawing, I really tried to show a parallel between like how I see my writing. And it is a worshipful experience. But there also is some tension. Like at the beginning, Daphne is like thinking that she's creating this like cute little pretty prayer journal picture but then Mm -hmm. it turns out like ugly and scary and as a Christian author and the author of Christian fiction specifically like you you do have to wrestle with that you've got to wrestle with how much do you let like whatever the creative inspiration that's in you dictates versus what -hmm. you know is going to be pleasing to God like I think about I've been thinking a lot about writing Christian music And there was a big shift. I listened to a lot of Christian music in the 90s. There's a huge shift. Like, I almost remember it to the month where it went from songs about God to songs to God. And it turned from songs that were just expressing the experience of Christians to songs that are worshipful songs sung to the Lord. And I think there's definitely a place for both, but it does beg the question of, like, I could write a devotional about Proverbs, and that feels very Christian, (laughs) and that feels very worshipful. I could write a novel about a missionary who falls in love and gets a happy ending, and that feels very Christian, but then you get into, okay, but what about, okay, here's this, here's this daughter going through really hard stuff, or here's this pastor whose family is involved in really shady stuff. And yeah, so that tension of letting your creativity 
out and not trying to censor it, but still knowing that you want to be honoring to God. (laughs) And sometimes it does feel like a pretty razor thin line, but that line is, I guess I I always try to be like on that line because I don't want it to be always just cute or predictable or happy endings. I definitely thought the ending was not going to be what it was. For sure. Speaking of cute and happy endings. (laughs) Was Daphne always going to be an artist then? Like you said, that was your intent. Did anything about it change? Like she was going to be someone who John drew, painted? (laughs) When I wrote Daphne, she's the, I would say, of the characters that I really tried to base off of characters from Rebecca and not just give them the name. Mm -hmm. She really does remind me of the narrator. So that's probably why the narrator in Rebecca does like some sketches and stuff. I think the other thing they definitely have in common is that like they're very daydreamy. Yeah. <laughs> when she's facing, I'm like, same. Like someone's talking here. I'm like, I'm sorry. I was 20 years ahead in the future. Yeah. So I think because of Rebecca, I knew that she would have some kind of artistic side. And in Rebecca, we just, it's just mentioned in passing a time or two that mm-hmm. she sketches. So I think the rest that we see, like that real spiritual depth to it is probably me just wanting to explore like what I love to do I love watching and learning about artists who aren't authors and how their creativity works because a lot of times it is very parallel and so I even like the kids and I watched this Netflix show where it's glass blowers so it has, yeah it on the surface has nothing to do with writing novels but it there were a lot of parallels in the creative process so some of it was that and then the only other character that I remember who I named and gave the personality of the namesake as Mrs. Van Hopper. Yeah, great. Just loud and abrasive and annoying, but kind and sweet on the inside. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Miss Van Hopper. She was one that I, like, we're in Daphne's head. And yeah. she, you're trying to discern with her, like, what's reality and what's not. And once we get to the end of the novel, we see Miss Van Hopper may not be all that... Daphne made up because she helped right. her with the reconstruction yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And so one of my questions I wrote down for you, if you want to share is, have you ever had an instance where you thought someone was like the villain, but turns out they were actually like kind and trying to help? Oh, yeah. Like in real life, do you mean? Yeah. Or mm-hmm. like, how do we keep ourselves from doing that? I feel like as women, we're really prone to do it. Make up the scenario yeah. in our head about someone. Yeah. That's not really truth. Okay, so let me back you up for just a second, because I think in general, like if we're doing just generalities, I think God has given women intuition about people for our protection, because if my husband meets somebody and forms the wrong impression and they're a dangerous person, but my husband doesn't notice it right away, when their violent tendencies come out, my husband's big enough and aggressive enough and protective enough that's going to come out when it needs to. For someone like you or me, if we meet somebody and they're dangerous, but they're good at presenting themselves as not, and they trick Mm -hmm. us, we actually, we have no way, no way. But We're more vulnerable. We're more vulnerable. And I think that's why women's intuition is an actual thing. So sometimes I think the snap judgments we make, we always need to be careful about them. But sometimes I do think that it is a protective, like warning signal that God gives us. Your creep alert. (laughs) But in... In this case, yeah, there is a specific personality and it is close to Mrs. Van Hopper that really does rub me wrong. I do remember actually, I'm going to have to skirt around it so that I wouldn't like make this person identifiable, but I met somebody significantly older than I am. And my initial impression was here's, here's somebody who just rubs me the wrong way. And it was that kind of abrasive personality like we see in Mrs. Van Hopper. And then we started talking more about stuff and I realized, oh, she actually has a ton of compassion. She is, so she's not the caricature, right? Mm-hmm. When we first meet Mrs. Van Hopper, she's the caricature of the loud, busybody Christian lady. And then we realized, oh, okay, she's more than the caricature. So yeah, I definitely think that I make that kind of judgment in the same way. And I don't think we need to necessarily, yes, we need to be loving to everybody. We need to respect everybody. I don't think we necessarily need to feel horrifically guilty 
if there are just some people that we don't enjoy spending as much time with as others. Like, yep. There are I... just personalities that don't gel. And mm-hmm. that doesn't mean they're a bad person. I don't think it necessarily means that you're a bad person. I think okay. there is a place where there can be two Christians who are just like, you know what? We are sisters in Christ. We are committed to loving each other. We pray for each other. We we don't gossip about each other. But we also know that we're not like you're not good. BFFs. Yeah, yeah it's it, okay. <laughs> neither of us are going to have a lot of fun like spending five hours together. Do you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's relatable. I remember when the realization that not everyone's going to want to be your best friend, and that's right. okay. That's why. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we haven't gotten to James yet, who is the fiance of yeah. Daphne, who when they meet at the diner, which Daphne works at, we're like Beatrice. We figure out she did really set it up. Uh-huh. But James claims that he was like called to ministry. Was he still really called to ministry? And do you think that James and Daphne could have worked out? Oh, what James? a good question. Okay. Yeah. James is interesting because he started out doing exactly what the family planned for him to do, just mm-hmm. be part of this big oil business, like part of this powerful, politically allied family. He was going to marry the senator's daughter. And then he, yeah, he leaves the family business and is involved in ministry. Although we can see just based on the church ladies we see, it is a hoity-toity church too. Right. I think, and then it comes out that, yeah, there was some family scandal going on, which is partly, it's definitely why his first engagement got called off. And it's mm-hmm. partly why he left the family business. I think it can be both. I think that you can be fired from a job and land a ministry position and be able to say that God called you to that job. Yeah. You know what I mean? We sometimes think that like calling has to be a hundred percent like from outside of us and outside of circumstances. Sometimes calling might be my house was destroyed in a hurricane and my cousin said, come and live in my basement. So God called me to go move. Yeah. (laughs) So in James's case, I don't see him as sharing in his family's guilt. I don't see him, I don't see his position in ministry as a sham. I do see him as a spoiled, privileged, trust fund kid, which, yeah, that is who he is. Especially (laughs) when he's, did you trick me? I was like, brother, please. She's, you have everything to gain here. But I think that in general, yeah, I think if we're judging just by the motives of heart, I think he's pure and innocent just a little bit. If he has any faults, his faults were not realizing that he wasn't ever overmanned and therefore maybe shouldn't have been engaged to somebody else. But again, maybe that was just the, if I got nervous about this book, It was that it's a Christian novel with a romance element where a pastor is engaged to somebody and they break up, then he's engaged to somebody else and they break up, and then he goes Mm -hmm. back to the first person. Because it's definitely not adultery in anybody's definition of it, but it's still, I think there are some Christian readers who'd be like, oh, you can't be in love with one person and later be in love with somebody else. Mm -hmm. That's not right. To your question of could he and Daphne have been happy together? I think for sure they could have. And like the book brings up this idea of soulmates a lot. And I don't think, I think that sometimes the problem that we get with the idea of a soulmate when taken to as extreme is that there is only one person that could be compatible Mm. with. I do believe that God designs us with a person in mind. That doesn't mean that, oh, I'm in love with you, but you moved and now we're not together. I don't think that means that you're never going to be able to theoretically be happy (laughs) with somebody else. So I think he and Daphne could have been okay. I think, I think their troubles would have come a lot. I think there is a life experience different. I never like mentioned their ages. I picture him as at least a little bit older than she is. And then just in terms of just the way they were raised, the class differences, Should that matter? No. Like we all like to think that in America, anybody can do anything, but it does have, yeah, yeah. She would always feel somewhat inferior, Mm -hmm. even if he didn't lord his wealth and status over her. I think that always be in the back of her head. So I'm not saying that a marriage with that big of a difference 
couldn't work, but it would have been hard for them in certain ways. Yeah. I, it's fun for me because I know so many of these places in the book and I'm like, Ooh, is she just sitting across at the next booth? And she was watching an yeah, interaction right. <laughs> and she's, this'll make a great story. Oh, just someone walking around out there who didn't know they were a writer's inspiration. Yeah. I love the fact that Manderly came back and was like the rescuer because mm. it's a twist if you know the story of Rebecca you're like what if Rebecca had lit what if mm-hmm. she had made it so did you always intend to have Manderly come back and be the no I wanted to make Manderly actually even more ominous and menacing I okay. wanted Manderly to be at least at the beginning there's there always could have been a twist at the end I wanted it to feel even more like Manderly was stalking Daphne Manderly was unhinged I would have enjoyed Right. <laughs> okay so the other fact you had in your author's note uh-huh. speaking of ominous things does alaska really have the highest death rate of politicians by airplane i haven't looked up other states but we've had a lot of politicians die in airplane crashes i am now on conspiracy level of like decades that's crazy we skipped ahead in some of my questions here okay <laughs> speaking of characters which one felt the easiest to write and which one felt the hardest character to write, even side characters? And how did you feel about Felipe? Is that mm. how you say her name? I think of it as Philippa. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so Mrs. Van Hopper was fun to write. Yeah. <laughs> because the Mrs. Van Hopper in Rebecca is so just outlandish and just such a caricature. It was fun to write that side of her. And because she has the type of personality that isn't my go-to, like, most comfortable type of person, it was fun for me to explore that in a way where, like, I knew she was, like, a sweet little lady. Do mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So that was really fun. None of the characters were very hard. Like I said, Manderly is one I would have loved to have found more ways to make her, like, even more menacing, Uh even if that was all just in Daphne's head. Specifically, I do always enjoy both writing and reading about like the very villainous, manipulative mom type character. So that's always fun. Beatrice reminded me of Rebecca, Mrs. Danvers, who's like the, the maid of the house and just very antagonistic and creepy and stoic. Yeah. And very proper, but also a village. Yeah. <laughs> the know? part where she's, we're making the nursing home. I'm like, that seems way too nice. And then when oh, it's yeah. revealed in the end, what actually happened, I'm like, yeah. wow, I would have signed the papers too. <laughs> so bad. No, there, there weren't any real hard characters. I like Becca, the roommate. She's just like fun and happy. And not much to her, at least that we see in this book. How about Gus? Do you like Gus? I love Gus. He is Gus. <laughs> all your favorite, like, out of all the husbands and all okay. the books. The one I like the most is probably, his name is Ricky Fields. He's in one of the later romances. He's in the one, I need to always look at the covers. He's in What <laughs> Dreams May Lie. Okay. Uh, he's the one there in the little farmer hat. Ah. I love Ricky because he's like a big old dork. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest dork. And I really like that just... Guy next door. I think now, don't they call them like cinnamon rolls or something? Cinnamon rolls. Yeah, yeah, like that. But to be fair, like Gus gets very little page time. But as of right now, he's probably my second favorite. Just because, so Gus is one of the ones where if I remember it, I don't think his name is taken from Rebecca. And when I picture him, I picture Gus from Psych. I, a comedy TV show my family like and I very specifically picture one episode where the character Gus and Psych goes undercover as an orderly yeah. at institution so like when I picture Gus in the book I'm picturing Gus from Psych in his scrubs it's like this whole thing that's very fleshed out in my head I love that I really like Gus because he was like a side character that did was holding Mm-hmm. so much of the story together yeah and the fact that he loved her mom like just took care yeah, of yeah he took care so of so much had the backstory about being a caretaker for his brother before that in romances I'm always going to be more of a fan for the second chance love than yeah. like the insta love or the I don't know of many enemies to lovers other than much ado about nothing that I enjoy <laughs> and so like this idea of yeah we were best friends like growing up and he's always been there for me and then you wake up one day and like oh I'm in love with you. <laughs> Why didn't I see this forever again? Yeah. One last question about the plot before I move into 
genre question uh-huh. is there's a scene speaking of the gap of social classes yeah where she's having a flashback to when all these like ladies were at her table and they gave her this big tip and they're videoing her and then they're like your kids for christmas are gonna have such <laughs> great time yeah. and she's like what are you talking about and she has to split it all with everybody yeah. anyway and so what kind of made you want to put that there so i've seen videos like that and they do really make me cringe and I, th- I think people who do that kind of thing so if, if people listening forget the part of the story when daphne is a waitress at Christmas time, a whole group of people come to her table, they order the meal, they pay her by giving her a hundred dollar bill each to cover the meal and tell her to to keep the extra. But they make it a big like social media show. Like they're mm-hmm. all recording her. So I love stories of like altruism and helping people, but I don't like it if it feels like it's for pity or Mm -hmm. for likes or for the videos yeah (laughs) so like the guy who goes up to the homeless person on the street and says, oh see that house there i just bought it for you to me that's icky that's not oh that's so sweet you bought him a house it would be different if it was done more anonymously and it wasn't done for the video and the reaction And then some of it, I have this funny thing I've read recently, is within the past couple of years, I recently read that Japanese culture is very, they don't tip at all. And it explained a lot because like, whenever I'm out at a restaurant, like not just because he's the husband, like Scott always does that side because to me I am terrified that I'm going to write the wrong number down uh, yeah I'm going to offend somebody if I give it t- and then there's a the question of if I give too much are they going to think that I assume that they're right. like destitute or I went to a writer conference in Las Vegas where everything is very tip oriented and it there was something about it that with my personality and cultural background just felt very icky and desperate Mm -hmm. and I'm not saying like this is just a commentary about my personal reaction to it and so especially those videos of like waitresses getting really big tips like they always make me so cringy (laughs) I think it just added to Daphne's and James's just uh, difference difference of Mm -hmm. where they're coming from Mm -hmm. okay so this book is classified as a psychological thriller, right? I think that's how it is. So why do you think people are so drawn to psychological thrillers? And like, what, as a Christian author, do you feel is the the benefit of being able to use that genre and mm-hmm. express different things of faith? Yeah, different people will define the genre in different ways. I think of psychological thriller as having most of these characteristics so it's almost always going to be like about just normal people it's not like a detective or a forensic scientist do you know what i mean okay like, so it's like an ev- yeah, everyday person yeah it's an everyday person who's not usually the type of person who's expected to be involved in like dangerous stuff it's not cia characters and military characters mm-hmm. it's usually really deep POV. So it's less like Daphne opened up her book and took out her pen. And it's more like Daphne is telling you're in Daphne's Mm -hmm. pretty deep. And then most psychological thrillers have to do with like family relations or romantic relations and things not being what they seem. And another hallmark of a lot of them is the main character. There's and and again, these are generalities, but in a lot of them, there's this sense of the main character questioning their own sanity. Like when she's like, <clears throat> why am I? Oh, gosh. The part where she stays in the house, I'm like, run, <laughs> run. Yeah. So she's always been worried about getting dementia like mm-hmm. her mom. Now she's starting to worry that she's going to get paranoia like her dad. Mm-hmm. So there's this, those are what I consider some of the hallmarks of what I call psychological thriller. I like it because... They are everyday people. So it makes it more, to me, it makes it more relatable. Like I could read a book about a hostage negotiator main character, but I would never like put myself in that situation where I was a hostage negotiator. So you're, you feel more removed uh-huh. from the character. So I like it for that reason. And then, yeah, I really like exploring the, what if people aren't what they seem and how does that work and how does that play out? It does make it harder writing Christian psychological thriller because in the secular psychological thriller world, 
the main character or the main characters like spouse or love interests are just as likely to be the villain as anybody else. Mm -hmm. And in this case, had it come out that Daphne killed her own dad, nobody would have been okay with it. Right. So, or Daphne and James got married and then she found out all this stuff about maybe James is completely complicit in everything his family did because it's a Christian novel. The question really as an author, I feel like my only choice would be to kill him off. Mm-hmm. Like there wouldn't be a ton, like she would have to kill him in self-defense or Gus yeah. would have to storm in. And <laughs> say the day. Yeah. I have, did you ever hear, as you're writing Daphne's, do you ever get so into her head that you are like, you yourself are looking around, like questioning everyone and everything? Not that, but I am Daphne in terms of how she'll take one thing and she'll be 10 years in the yeah. future. <laughs> That's very much me. <laughs> I was wondering if it's the same as like when you read thrillers or like when I read Rebecca or books like these I get a little bit of paranoia where I'm like Mm -hmm. looking behind my shoulder and all that type of stuff no I don't do that for me it's more about if I were to make this a thriller but I yeah (laughs) did you find that you had more energy or less energy from writing a book like this as opposed to maybe like a romance or something like that definitely more I like the twists and the turns I, like I said at the beginning, I didn't know how things were for sure going to end. And so that's always fun for me. I didn't know she was going to end up with Gus. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know if James was going to be more complicit or more innocent. I knew the mom was going to be involved. I always see when you say stuff like that, I always picture you writing a bit, like, huh, interesting. That, kind of, <laughs> you know, that sort of is how it feels. And not every author does it that way. Some authors know pretty well start to finish how it's going to go but for this it was just like, let's jump in and see what happens <laughs> so yeah that was the other fun part about reading this I'm like I wonder at what point she wrote this scene was like this on a day where she was like super zesty yeah, because right. she had been writing it okay so will there be a series of Daphne and these characters or are these kind of standalone there probably won't be a series of these characters there might become a series If the right ideas came to me, I would love a series that took either other hymns like this and had a similar feel, or maybe more specifically from Amazing Grace. I'm not sure yet. I would love for there to be at least a few more books with a similar feel, but I don't, I haven't come up with the right premise quite yet. I was like, maybe she's going to just do re, not retelling, homages. I know, that would be fun too. That would be fun too. Because I... As an Alaskan, just really enjoyed. Oh, I know these places. Mm-hmm. No, Claudie's brothers. Yeah. I am in there. That, yeah, yeah. It's really fun. Um, the condo that they live in, I had a very specific. There was a woman that I used to go to church with who was very well to do. They lived in this really big. So the condo is almost exactly theirs. And the funniest thing. So she, I didn't deliberately put this in, but it was a really similar. She had basically upgraded her wardrobe. So she invited me over to take whatever I wanted (laughs) from the old stuff. And her room was all on the top floor and it had no doors. I'm like, this is weird. And is it just because do you get to a certain like income level or luxury level where like doors are the Oh, that was in my scene too. I was like, oh, she's going to put on a dress that Manderly wore. Oh, is that, that would have been going to <laughs> Is the sister actually Rebecca? That would have fit. <laughs> so, if you had to write another character story from the book, which one were you? Probably take Becca. Okay. Yeah. Because right now she's a blank slate. All we know about Becca is she's, she's a waitress, she's pretty happy go lucky, and she loves weddings. Yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> Could be a lot of cute stories with Becca. Beyond that, I don't really know. If I had to do more with Daphne, it would it would go back to her mom. And maybe as her mom's mm. getting more and more suffering from dementia before she dies, maybe like her mom was a witness to a crime years ago and is trying to make a deathbed confession but isn't coherent. Like stuff yeah. like that. that would be interesting. But no, I don't think there's much more to do with Daphne and Gus specifically they're just every so often I've got characters I'm like you two have been through enough you're yeah, fine you guys can have a happy go live your happy ever after <laughs> so which of your books would you pair it with if you like this you would like this also and then uh-huh. who would you give 
Like what type of person would you give those books to? Yeah, I would actually pair it two things. If you like the Alaska and the suspense side, I've got a whole series of Alaska romantic suspense. Mm -hmm. But if you liked more of the psychological side, I would recommend Breath of Heaven. And it's one of my women's fiction ones. It's real deep POV, what we see like you're very much in the character's head. And she's a pastor's wife. And so it, it has a lot. To, and this one's actually almost opposite, where she comes from a little bit of like hoity-toity high society. She marries a rural pastor. Her mom's horrifically disappointed in her. That one sounds good. And there's struggling with all the Mrs. Van Hoppers in yeah. the church. So that one doesn't have suspense in it, but also she's a musician in that book. She's a violinist. And if you liked seeing the, if you liked the portrayal of Daphne's artistic somewhat more like that would be a recommendation. That one's Breath of Heaven. Nice. And then who would I give it to? I definitely thought about you multiple times. Yes. Because, because oh, totally my spooky season book. Because <laughs> you and I have talked before about the book Rebecca. So I knew that you would recognize it. How soon did you recognize it? The first line. And then when I was like, wow, I just am such a loser. I just said this reminds me of another book. I am terrible. <laughs> and then as soon as like Maxwell and Van, I was like, so pretty <laughs> early on. <laughs> and, yeah. But I do love Rebecca and Daphne Demore. Yeah. Um, I think it's, I don't, other than, yeah, I'd give it to Mackenzie. <laughs> yeah. There truly was. A sense of, she's going to have fun with this. In this one, I actually did put, so in, in all of my books, like we've talked about some of the Easter eggs I've put in mm -hmm. the Kennedy books and how there will be like a callback to a character. And in this one, I knew I didn't want to bring in tons of other of my characters. So a lot of my Easter eggs, you caught a lot of them are just Alaska things, but a lot of them were hidden gems for like specific people to find. Oh, that's God bless the broken road is the song that's at Manderley and James's wedding. Mm -hmm. And that was the wedding song at my maid of honor and Scott Smith's man's wedding. And my maid of honor had gone through a broken engagement before that. Like it was really sweet. So that was there. Some of Jamie's stories about her mom, I put in specifically yeah, if anything, there was almost like, you're going to like this part of it. You're going like to like this part. My business partner, Julie, doesn't read my books because she doesn't like scary stuff. <laughs> but I got about two thirds through this one. I'm like, you know what? I think this is one Julie's going to be able to read. Okay. Okay. And so the whole wedding scene, I was thinking of her because she loves writing wedding epilogues. She's a romance writer. She <laughs> loves writing romance <laughs> epilogues. <laughs> And wedding epilogues. And so I'm like, this is going to be fun. Did the wedding scene surprise you or by that point where you come? So I'm like, there's no way she's going to marry James. Do you like how he, how they, those last four chapters went? Because I thought this is, they have to talk about it. There's yeah. no way they can't, yeah. but she's mm -hmm. also recovering. And then I thought, oh, they're not going to get married. But then I was like, oh, wait, are they? Oh, wait, no, they're not. <laughs> sure. I'm like, okay, it makes sense. Oh. I did like that there was like closure to both of them. Yeah. Because sometimes you like a hang. Yeah, my reaction for this book was there are so many thrillers out there. And I think that the kids that I'm around, like the teens and stuff, they like it because it's a page turner. Mm -hmm. But there's not a lot that I could give them that I'm not like, you have to skip like this much right. because right. part of what they think a thriller is. So Anyway, I just thought this is a good one to give because you could binge it in an afternoon. It's so good mm -hmm. for a spooky season. And I can think of a couple girls that would. Adi's brothers and yeah, Persona right. and Eureka. Yeah. My other questions were, what things were you loving when you wrote this book? So drinks or food, shows, things you were doing. Can you remember? I did write it a little bit in spurts. And so it's a tiny bit hard for me to recall like this one was harder than the majority of books to finish and some of that was just because I was coming out of a dry creative spell some of it was because like things would happen that would interrupt my writing but then I knew I had to keep going with it so I don't <laughs> basically I just remember all the things that were really hard getting <laughs> <laughs> it's okay too <laughs> so we are the end of fall season here in alaska pretty much. and my last few questions have to do with the season Fine. so what were your favorite things when you were a kid to do around fall time or that happened that fall time so i grew up in california we didn't really experience mm. changing seasons very significantly 
But let's see. I remember by college out on the East Coast, so college in Boston and then a year in Vermont right after that, just how beautiful. That's like epitome falls. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Growing up, we would do a fun, like, costume carnival, and nobody would use the word Halloween, <laughs> but it was around, <laughs> it was around October 31st, and you could wear costumes, just not the scary kind of costumes, and it was always a big deal, and there, we would bring, we wouldn't bring, like, bags or pumpkins, we'd bring pillowcases to yeah. all the candy. I, I have a funny trick-or-treating story. I was in junior high. And I had been invited to a friend's birthday party and it was on Halloween night, but it wasn't a costume party because we were in junior high and we were like so more, <laughs> more mature than that. And I had been to her house before, but I am so bad with directions. My dad got me to the right street, but I went to the wrong house. Oh, that happens to me all the time too. <laughs> so I show up and of course, this is pre-GPS and pre-cell phones. So I knock on the door. I'm dressed in regular junior high clothes and I'm carrying a wrapped birthday present. <laughs> but it's Halloween night and somebody who's very clearly not her mom or dad opens the door. <laughs> And for a half a second, I told myself, I could just say trick or treat and they would never go. <laughs> That's not how trick or treating works. So I'm a kid's <laughs> And they go just like, oh, wrong house. And they're like, do you want some candy? I'm like, nope. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, what are you looking forward to for the winter season? So we've got the end of fall. What are you looking forward to? It doesn't have to be an event. It can be a thing. This time of year, like I really have grown to love fall. And even in Alaska, we get a, a fairly pretty fall. But there always is a little bit of fear going into winter just because mm -hmm. it's so extreme and so dark and so hard. My oldest is coming home from college for Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be fun. Oh, that's not too uh, fun. He has a couple friends he even might want to bring home. And so that's yeah. that feels good. Yeah, see him again, have him home over, over Christmas break will be nice. So Probably that, just having the whole family back together again after a semester with him at school is going to be really nice. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, my other fun thing is if you did have to do a classic retelling in Alaska, which one would you do? What would be your pick or your top three? A few others that I've thought about doing similar to Rebecca. I've thought about Anne of Green Gables. I think that can be pretty fun. Thank you. I've thought about Christy, which doesn't surprise you at all. Oh, that one makes sense. There are, like, there's several more, like, classic-y kind of books, but I couldn't picture, I couldn't picture how to make crime and punishment work, <laughs> for example. Maybe Little Women, but it's not my favorite, yeah. to be honest. So probably Anna Green Gables and Christy would be the first two mm. that would pop into my mind. And those would fit. You said Anna Green Gables. I'm like, Kenny Lake. Yeah. All of them. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah. And then my last question for you, if you can answer it, is are you currently working on anything right now? Or are you taking a little creative break? I'm not working on fiction. I'm like. Half That's what threw me off. You lied. I, you remember you said you're working on a nonfiction. Yeah, that wasn't a lie. <laughs> yeah, because I was like, are you working on anything else? And then, but actually you were writing this book. This one had already been finished. Oh, okay. So I have started a Christian nonfiction. Jamie and I have written a book that we just need to get edited on prayer. I started, I'm three quarters of a chapter, excuse me, or maybe it's like a chapter and a half into what might be my next novel, but... Again, sometimes I just dabble to see what sticks. It's kind of like some spaghetti at the wall. So I'm not exactly <laughs> sure what's coming out next. <laughs> That's exciting. Yeah. Okay, so let me ask you, of the characters, who did you enjoy the most? Definitely Daphne. Yeah. Because aren't we all a little crazy sometimes? <laughs> And uh, probably Miss Van Hopper. She's just so funny. Like when they're having the dinner conversation <laughs> and I'm like, wow, I was in a similar conversation not too long ago. And I thought to myself, what in the world? And then, yeah, Miss Van Hopper is pretty fun. She is pretty fun. I wonder if we should give her a story. <laughs> yeah. Young Miss Van Hopper, who would be scan like 
older Miss Van Hopper would be scandalized, scandalized by her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mackenzie. And thanks to everyone for joining us.